Hello everybody, we're back again for another episode from Golf Cart Garage. I am Tim. Uh, we will talk about some golf cart related issues today. We're probably going to talk to some live people in the chat, just like we do every Tuesday and Thursday. We come here every Tuesday and Thursday at 12 o'clock noon Central Time and go through a, over some questions that we get. We get lots of questions at Golf Cart Garage all the time. I am a member of the Gearheads On Demand service that is offered by Golf Cart Garage. That is a service that we offer where you can actually schedule an appointment call with me, with myself. Uh, if you're interested in that, click the link in the description that will take you to the scheduling page. Uh, if the time slots are full, I mean, my, uh, my time slots usually fill up pretty quickly. So if all the time slots are full, just catch me here. Remember, I come here twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday. Try to catch me on live, have your question ready. I'll see if I can, if, see if I can help you. But if you, if you find a time slot, by all means, to choose a time slot and I'll call you at, the, at whatever time you pick, whatever's convenient for you. I get notified automatically. It's an automated system, so uh, I'll be on time. And if you think it's a video, you can sign up for the video in the same, in the same scheduling pages that you're looking at. You can, uh, you can, we can make it a video instead of a phone call, or you can just make it a phone call and we can switch it to video in the middle of the phone call if it's something that I need to see. Most of the time I don't need to see it, but sometimes I might. So we could do it either way. Let's see. We are live right now on Facebook and YouTube. And these are all the other social media links I'm running right now that you can follow us on. If you like this content, if you, if you like coming here and talking about golf cars as much as uh, myself and other people that come here regularly do. Okay. Let me check over here just for a second looks like we're good looks like we're ready to go ready to rock and roll here so we're going to get started anybody in the live feel free to participate anytime you you uh you need to tell me how's the weather it's still cold here still getting kind of still cool outside here question number one got an intermittent skip in the drive when applying the power can be eliminated when you nurse the power very gently. When at a standstill, if you demand power abruptly, it skips out and cart won't move. When running, skips intermittently if you demand abruptly. What do you think the problem is? Controller? Anything else to check? Well, you didn't tell me you didn't tell me what kind of car you have, but because there's a, an interruption when you hit it hard, you know, like what you're saying, when you, when you hit the power abruptly, it is either going to be, it's either going to be, you know, that honestly, a bad battery can cause that. A bad battery could cause that issue. A battery that's dropping out when you hit it hard, that doesn't drop out when you go gentle, you know, that, they, that could cause that. Uh, another thing, it could be whatever type of potentiometer you're using. Like it, if, it's a, if it's a club car we're talking about, it could be your M-Core. If it's an easy go, it could be your ITS. If it's a Yamaha, it could be your throttle position sensor, you know, that's, that's skipping out when you hit it abruptly. But the, the, the first thing, I, I know I say this all the time, but I need to eliminate that being a battery issue first because a battery could cause that symptom. Ricky Smith, what's up, Ricky, on YouTube? Glad you're here, man. Greg Elliott, hey Tim, on uh, cold in Bristol today. I have pics to send you. Need your email. It is, my email is 00 Tim Freeman at gmail.com. That's my email. That's my work email. 00 Tim Freeman, F R E E M A N dot com. At, I mean, I'm sorry, at gmail.com. Anthony Moore, what's up, Anthony? Hello, Gearhead peeps. Glad to have you, Anthony. Let me see what's going on here on Facebook. We got Charles Ferguson. What's up, Charles Ferguson? Tim, can you tell me the difference between a a series and a direct motor, and how can I tell which one I have? I think what you're asking me, Charles, is the difference between a series round motor and a shunt wound motor. Uh, Cause the, they're both direct drive, 
to the to the rear end. That's what the what the word direct is used because it's direct drive. That means there's no clutches or anything. The motor bolts up on a spline shaft, you know, so there's there's no slack. I mean, that motor turns, the rear end's going to turn. But there's two different types of electrical systems. One of them is a series electrical system, and that would be in cars that do not have a run toe switch under the seat. And the other is a shunt wound electrical system. That would be cars that do have a run toe switch under the seat. Now those two electrical systems are going to have two different types of motors. One of them is considered a series motor and one of them is considered a shunt wound motor. If it, if it is a series motor, there will not be a speed sensor attached to the end of the motor. If it is a shunt wound motor, there will be a little black thing on the end of the motor with some wires that go and hook up somewhere in your golf cart. So that's how you can tell which one you have. Well, basically, look for a run toe switch under your seat. If you have a run toe switch under your seat, you do not have a series motor. You have a shunt wound motor. Hope that answers your question, Charles. Joe Foster on Facebook. Tim, good day. What's up, Joe? Can a regular 6-volt heavy-duty battery be used to replace a deep cycle 6-volt? Well, it can, but I would not recommend it because it's not gonna act like your other six volt batteries. But if you just needed to do that for some kind of testing purposes, then that would be fine just for testing, just to make sure that everything's, uh... but don't, don't use the cart and charge the cart expecting that to work on long, for long term. That would just be for testing purposes. But yes, it would work to get you out of a bind there. Let's see. On uh, YouTube, we got Gary D. What's up, Gary D? I have a 95 Club Car Electric. Same problem on start going, on start going. Any ideas? The batteries are good. Same problem on start going. Uh, Gary, rephrase the question a little bit. Help me out there. Uh, 95 Club Car. Okay. 95 you could have if not you say the batteries are good all right that's cool it does the solenoid click you know would be my first question when you touch the accelerator pedal with key on does your solenoid click so we need to get to that point first envy nature girl what's up envy nature girl i spoke with you on the phone I spoke with envy nature girl she gave me some advice on my internet uh her and her husband good to talk to you the other day good morning tim thank you good morning to you uh I haven't ordered my Cat7 cable yet, but I think that's the route I'm going to take. I did check on what your husband told me about the T-Mobile stuff. And so far, it says that it's not available at my address. And I don't understand why, because I can see cell towers around me. But So we're going to do some checking, but it says that it's not available at my address. I was considering going that route also, but the, the, Cat, the Cat7 is still on the, on the table also. But anyway, thank you for your help and advice on that. I appreciate it very much. Let's see. Where am I at here? Number two. That's where I'm at. Lost track. Oh, Gary says uh, he does, doesn't hear it clicking. All right. 90, let me tell you this, Gary, 95 is kind of a weird year for a club car. Uh, do you know which potentiometer you have in that car? Because you have one of two different types in 95. You either have a V-Glide or you have the kind that's up under the car. It's the old timey, uh, it's up under the car. It's a little black thing. Your accelerator linkages are, are go through it. It kind of looks like an M core, but it's not because I didn't have M core in '95. They had what's called th this uh, resistor type potentiometer that causes a lot of problems. In that potentiometer, there is a small micro switch. There's also a micro switch in the V Glide. Both of those micro switches are in the chain of command in, for electricity flow to activate your solenoid. So if you and in '95, it's a possibility you got that weird potentiometer up under the car, which they only used for about a year and a half. So if that's what you have, 
then what you're going to need is probably an MCOR, uh, it's called a pre MCOR to MCOR conversion kit. You're going to have to convert your car to MCOR because that one's not available anymore. That old one's not available. Number two. Hi, Tim. I have a 2004 48-volt DS car. I think the motor controller is bad. I have put a new OBC and a new solenoid, new battery. The motor will run on 24 volts when it all hooked up. The solenoid gets hot. The controller is a Curtis model. It looks like it got hot. Has the controller gone bad? Thank you for your help. Uh, if the controller looks like it got hot, see, if you can physically, if you can physically look at the controller and see that it got hot, then it got really hot. All right. And, uh, I, I would have questions about how that could even get that hot. Uh, th there's only one way I know of that you can get one that hot. And that would be to tow the car with this run tow switch and run. That will get that controller that hot to where it will physically deform. So if you're looking at that controller and you can tell that controller got hot, then, oh yeah, I'd say it's bad. And you probably got a lot of other things bad too. Because uh, if, uh, if it got that hot, it could have, it could have been, uh, because someone towed the car with it and it's still in run. And that could have fried the motor controller and it could even hurt the batteries too. So I'd have more questions about that one. Gary D says, I have micro switches. Now, well, what do you mean, Gary? You talking about, I'm talking about on the, uh, up under the car. I'm not talking about on your forward and reverse switch. I, I understand you have micro switches on the back side of your forward and reverse handle, but I'm talking about up under the car. What type of potentiometer do you have? It, you're either going to have V glide. That's you. You can see the V glide by raising the seat. The V glide would be under the back side of your charging receptacle, straight down below it. That would be, and it would be a, a black triangular box about that about that big that would be the v glide with a lid on it that's removable or do you have the other type that's under the car if there would be no v glide there you need to look under the car let's see ricky smith says tim this might sound stupid there's nothing that sounds stupid ricky this might sound stupid, but how does the speed controller work? 05 TXT PDS. How does the speed controller work? Well, I don't know how, how complicated of an answer do we want to, do we want to try to, to go there? Well, it is the speed controller is full of diodes, all kinds of diodes in there. That's why when they blow up, they smell like they kind of smell. It put off a smell, smells like rotten eggs when a, when a, when a controller burns up. It's because when a, that's what a diode smells like when it pops, but there's full of diodes in there. And uh, the, the simple thing is that it receives a signal. It has an input side of a controller, has an input side. It receives a signal from whatever type of potentiometer your electric vehicle has. This is not just golf carts. This is in general. This is electric cars, uh, uh, you know, all electric vehicles. They have some sort of potentiometer that sends a signal to the controller. Depending on what that signal is, the controller outputs amps and voltage to the motor to make it turn. That's the simple way to look at it. Gary D says he has V-Glide. All right. If you have V-Glide and your solenoid is not clicking, then it could be either your solenoid is bad or you have that micro switch inside that V-Glide is not activating the solenoid. That's where I would be going on that particular uh, issue. I would be looking at that micro switch. If you know how to use a, uh, if you know how to use a, a ohm meter or a voltmeter on the ohm setting, you just, you, you need to test that micro switch for continuity. Make sure that it's going on and off as you push your gas pedal. Cause that, as soon as you touch your gas pedal, it, act, it clicks that micro switch. Envy Nature Girl, do you guys ever think of selling refurb golf carts? We actually do. We've uh, I've talked to the uh, I've talked to the owner about that, and uh, that's that's always a possibility. 
that's always a possibility. Uh, he had mentioned something at one time about maybe getting a shop and actually selling some golf carts. So that's that might happen. I don't know. I don't know what's. I hadn't talked to him about that in quite a while, but uh, we did talk about that at one time. Gary D says, I'm guessing it's original parts. Well, it, it could be. I mean, that's why I'm saying anything could happen in a 95. I mean, that's that's pretty old in the golf cart world, you know, 95. There's a lot of them older, but there's that's pretty old. Number three, let me check over here on Facebook. No, we're good there. Number three is... I have a 2021 club car frame with an alpha body kit. Recently, my batteries died to the point that nothing would power up. After some research, I figured out how to get them charged back up. Now the golf cart will not go over three to five miles an hour in forward or reverse. Any ideas on what I can do to fix it? Well, if your batteries are fine, you know, you didn't tell me what your battery readings are when you say they're fine. I mean, because, you know, if your batteries were extremely low, that could cause that too. Uh, if you're sure your batteries are fine, then my guess is that you have an unrelated problem, which would be the speed sensor. It sounds like you have a speed sensor issue if everything was working before. Because uh, three to five sounds like the car's in limp mode, and that, that could be a speed sensor issue right there. So does your car have a run tow switch? If it does, then I would be, I would be, focusing in on the speed sensor on the end of the motor. I'd replace it. They're not very expensive. I'd just replace that speed sensor. Let's see. Gary D says, thanks for the information. No problem, Gary D. It's uh, it's actually good, Gary, that you have V-Glide. That's a good thing in a 95. Because if you had the other thing, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a project to get that M, pre-M core to M core conversion kit. That's, that's a big project. I don't know if you want to take that off, but so it's good that you have V-Glide and you can, you know, if it turns out to be that little micro switch inside there, then that'd be relatively easy compared to the other one. Let's see. Anthony Moore says, do you prefer gas over electric owning wise? I think I talked about that before. That's, that's a, that's a good, it's a good question. It's a common question that we get. This is, this is what I say. This is what I used to say, you know, the times have changed over the years in the golf cart world. So my opinion has swayed and gone back and forth a couple of times. Uh, let's go back. Just if we, let's say we're talking about lead acid golf cart batteries, lead acid battery golf cart and gas. This is what I would tell my customers. I would say that, well, if you, you know, cause they would ask me, what should I get? Should I get an electric or gas? My, in my head, what I'm saying, it says it really just depends on how much you're going to neglect it. That's, you know, that, I don't say that to the customer, but that's what's going on in my head. That's the answer to the question. Because a lot of people think of it when they got a lead acid battery golf cart, they say, oh, well, all I got to do is charge it up. But well, that's not true. That's not all you got to do. You got to keep in mind, you have to, you have to be on top of what your battery charging situation is all the time with it, with an electric lead acid cart. You have to know that your cart is being maintained properly. Your, your batteries are being maintained properly. You have to know that. So you have to keep up with that. Uh, that's the, the, the thing that causes people the most amount of trouble is not maintaining their batteries. And it's, it's not just a, a, you know, charge it and forget it kind of thing. You've got to maintain your water level, correct water level, or you'll end up with garage You'll end up with acid on your garage floor, wherever you park the car. You, you do have alamites and, uh, or zerks or grease fittings on the front end. You know, you might, uh, once a year or so, you might need to squirt some grease in, but it's a little more than, uh, just charging it and forget about it. Now, on the other hand, a gas golf cart, gas golf carts are awesome and they do handle neglect fairly well. Other than bad gas, like, you know, like letting it sit for too long and the gas going bad, there's not a whole lot that you have to do in one year. And they don't use very much gas and hardly at all. And they're not very loud either. So if you're in a community or you're in a situation where you were going to neglect your golf cart for long periods of time and you want it to work when you come back and you step on the gas pedal and you take off and go, gas might be the answer for you. Uh, now that was lead acid. Now that lithium is taken over things are kind of changing a little bit because with lithium, 
it really does take the thought process of maintaining your batteries out of the equation. You don't even gotta worry about it anymore. You just you charge your golf cart. You know, because you don't have to worry about water levels. You're not going to tear up your garage floor. You're not going to do anything. So lithium is causing things to even out as far as my argument there about handling neglect better. So if you're in a situation where uh, you don't even want to, you don't even care about lithium or you don't even understand the advantages or you don't even need that and you want something maybe less expensive, lithium is going to cause that car to be a little more expensive than gas nowadays. So it's up to you really now, especially with lithium. If you're comparing lithium to gas, then it's pretty even. If you're comparing lead acid to gas, if you can get away with gas, then it's, it's, uh, they handle neglect a little better, you know, than, than electric. So some situ some people are in a situation where they can't have gas. They have to have electric cars because of POA rules or HOA rules, you know, in their community they live in might not allow it. I don't, I don't know. I guess I talked to a long time on that, uh, that question, Anthony. I hope that answers your question. Butch, favorite Hardy. What's the simplest way to change out the motor coupler? Now that's a good question. And I can answer that because I've had to do it many times. The, the, the coupler, what he's talking about is that the coupler on the end of an electric motor, you look at it and you say, well, how in the world do I get that off of there? You know, I, I don't know how to get that off. You can't, I can't find a puller that goes in there and goes around it. So this is how you do it. I'm not, I, in fact, I think, I don't think I've ever talked about this on the air. So that's, that's a, this, that's the first time that that question has been talked about on the air. That motor coupler is pressed on. It is just pressed on. It's not welded. It is pressed on. So the way you get it off is you, you have to go to a welding shop or you have to either weld yourself or you have to know somebody that does. What you do is you take a big nut, like a, a, a probably about a one inch nut, and you're gonna tack that onto that coupler. You're gonna tack it right onto the top of the coupler. Just tack it in about four or five spots. Then you're gonna take a bolt that will go through the nut and run that bolt down down the nut until it bottoms out. And what that's doing, it's gonna pull that it's gonna pull that coupler off. That's how you do it. It's that simple. Uh, just a couple of tacks of a nut on, t on that coupler and then run a bolt through it and then it's done. And it, it, obviously the coupler's toast anyway, so you, you're not going to hurt anything by, you know, by, by welding on it. Let's see, Ricky said, the speed sensor, sorry, I meant the speed sensor. What was that you asked about? The speed sensor work. Well, the speed sensor is basically just a magnet. And what, what that magnet is, it's monitoring revolutions of the motor. And that's only in that type of electrical system that that is necessary to have a speed sensor in a, in a, a PDS has a shunt wound electrical system. You got, we talked about that earlier, series wound electrical system and shunt wound. All shunt wound electrical systems have a speed sensor on the end of the motor. And it's a magnet that's, that's reading pulses from the revolutions of the engine. There's a, there's a big magnetic field that, that the motor produces back there. So a lot of, that's why a lot of times stereo installations don't really work out like people thought on golf cars, because as soon as they hit the gas pedal, there will be interference in the stereo. That's because of all the magnetic field that's being generated that you don't even realize until you start trying to run electronic things close to it. Mason Grove. What's up, Mason? Hey, Tim, for many. Sorry I'm late. Uh, no problem, Mace. I'm glad you're here. Glad you got it. Glad you made it here. Let me see. Where am I at now? I think I am on number four. Is that where I'm at? Number four on the regular questions? Yeah. My 2010 club car Precedent Electric moves very slow and kills the full charge batteries in about 10 minutes. What could possibly cause that? Well, your batteries, I would have to ask questions like how old are your batteries first? That would be my question. But you have to understand your batteries in a precedence 48 volt system. So you either have six, eight volt batteries or you have four 12 volt batteries in that precedent, one or the other. If you'll notice those batteries have caps on them, you know, in the 12 volt battery, there's six holes in the top. 
If you've got six 8 volt batteries, those 8 volt batteries have four holes in the top. Each one of those holes in both systems represents one 2 volt battery. 2 volt battery. So your golf cart doesn't actually have, when you got four 12s in there, you don't actually have four 12s. You've got six times four. You've got 24 two volt batteries in there is what you got. And if just one of those two volt batteries, one of those cells goes bad, the golf cart will not operate correctly. And it could, it could do some weird stuff like what you're describing. So you could have just one cell bad and it could cause the symptoms that you're talking about. You even fully charged off the charger, but you go out there and in 10 minutes, one of those cells drops out. And, and it could cause your symptom. So I would have questions of, of, about that, the age of your batteries, you know, what kind of voltage, and then when the golf cart stops in 10 minutes, take some voltage readings in, because that would be the nice time to try to find it. That would be the easy time to find it. Number five, I lose power sometimes when I'm pushing the accelerator down, possible cause. Uh, not a lot of info. Not a lot of info in that question for me to go on there. Uh, uh, we talking? If I'm assuming we're talking about an electric car, so uh, I've said this probably uh, 50 times, but you know, over these these episodes. But uh, battery readings at the time of failure is what I would need. That would be the easiest way to to eliminate that at the time of failure. So when you lose power, I want some battery readings then, right then. Number six, but I'm going to check over here first. No, I'm good there. I have a 2008 36 volt EasyGo TXT PDS. Motor stop says series motor, but only runs on test parallel. Jumper only S1 to A1. Okay, we got some mixed up facts here. We need to to get straight first. All right, if you indeed have a 36 volt EasyGo TXT PDS, it would be hard for me to believe that the motor shop says it's a series motor because it's not. An EasyGo PDS has a shunt wound motor, not a series motor. Uh, Curtis 1206MX controller fries the F1, F2 drivers. Okay. The Curtis 1206MX is a shunt wound motor controller for an EasyGo PDS. All right. So the only thing that, uh, that is wrong here is what you say the motor shop says. It's not a series motor. That, that's a completely different motor. A PDS uses a Curtis 1206MX controller and it fries the F1, F2 drivers. Hmm. Well, you, it sounds like you got a, a bad controller there for sure. But yeah, you need to get that straight with the motor shop because they're they're going to confuse you if they uh, if they talk about that being a series motor because it is not. Number seven. Nature girl, NV Nature girl says, how much of a drop using the method of a meter? with alligator clips and then driving the golf cart around would justify a bad battery six volt. The, the, the way that there's no perfect answer for that question, but you're looking for one that it drastically drops more than the other ones. In other words, I want to make sure you do that test six times, you know, or ever how many batteries you have in your car. So six volt battery, if it drops down to four under hard acceleration, that's probably normal. They're probably all going to do that under hard acceleration. What you're looking for is the one that drops down worse than the others because they all should be relatively even. So if you just, if you have one that just drops down two, vo two volts more than the others, that is, act that is definitely going to be your worst battery because I've said it before, no bad, no set of batteries dies at the same time. They never die at the same time. There's always going to be one that goes bad before the rest. Number seven, Yamaha 2014 gas 
Motor keeps running after turning off. Have to disconnect battery cable to stop it. Someone told me it could be the start stop relay. Any ideas? Yeah, the I haven't had my first place I would be is under that floor mat because on a Yamaha, if you take that floor mat up, which is relatively easy on a Yamaha, it's easier than the other two brands of golf carts. It's, other, it's easier than club car and easy to go take the floor mat up. You take the floor mat up on a Yamaha, there's, a, there's an access panel under the floor mat and you don't even have to have any tools to remove it. You just take the access panel out and you'll be able to see your accelerator pedal linkages and you'll be able to see the pedal stop switch. Now, sounds like to me that your pedal swap stop switch has, has closed on you or, and it's not releasing when you release the gas pedal. And I've, you know what I've seen? I've seen this on a Yamaha. That pedal stop switch is in a bad spot. It can actually get sticks hung up in there and cause some problems. So yeah, take the floor mat up and check that area out. And after, if you don't see any debris like sticks or there's causing you, operate your accelerator pedal and watch how it acts with that pedal stop switch. And you'll see what I mean. And you might have to ohm out that pedal stop switch and make sure that it's uh, functioning correctly. I would bet it's not. Okay, that was seven. Number eight. I have an easy go older model 36 volt cart. I believe it's a 2004 TXT. The batteries read 37.6 when I test them in series. They all test over six volts individually. When I take the cart out, it doesn't seem to be running full power. And after a short period of time, the cart loses power and I can't climb small uh, inclines. Can you tell me what might be the cause? Most likely it's one of two things. Uh, when you get to the point where you can't climb small inclines. When, it, when, you, when your car gets to that point, take those battery readings again, the same readings that you just told me that you had. Take them then. See if you see anything drastically different uh, because uh, you could have one of them dropping out, like I said, and, and you'd, you'd need to find it. So when it when it's starting to have trouble climbing inclines, go through and take those same readings again. It could be that, or if your car is lifted with taller tires on it, Depending on which one, you know, which electrical system you have, uh, you could be getting something hot and could be going into thermal shutdown. Did you tell me, tell me what, oh, you said a 2004 TXT. Yeah. Okay. It could be in a 2004, depending on which electrical system you have, you could have a controller that's going into thermal shutdown. It's getting too hot. So feel, put your hand on the controller cover. See if you feel any heat. If you want to, you can remove the controller cover and put your hand on the controller itself. See if it's getting hot. Could be that if you have the a series wound 2004 TXT, it could be your Ford in reverse. That a series wound car has a mechanical Ford in reverse assembly. They have been known to start to get hot when they start to go bad, and the car was not it will not allow it will not produce or allow the flow of amperage to get through it. All your amps go through that mechanical Ford in reverse switch, so it, that has been known to happen. So feel for heat is what I'm saying. When it starts to fail, start looking for heat if you're sure it's not your batteries. Let's see, number nine, I'm gonna check over here. Let's see, Charles Ferguson says, what terminals at shunt motor do I jump with a battery to test? You, you jump, let me see here. Let's see if I got this right here. I thought I had that on my desk because I didn't want to say anything wrong there. Tell you what, Charles. Let me see. Thought I had that sitting right here on my desk. No, this is for a series motor I had on my desk. And a series is an A to an S, you know, and then the other two terminals you put 12 volts to. But a shunt motor is different. You you make two you make two jumpers on a shunt motor. Like you make, uh, I believe it's A to an F, and then A to an F, and then you put 12 volts to those too if I'm not mistaken, but I tell you what, I bet if you plug in shunt motor testing 
and you'll, you'll, you'll come up with that test real easy to make sure, because I don't want to tell you wrong on there, Charles. But yeah, there is a way to do it. There is a way to do to jumper a shunt motor and put 12 volts to it. Number nine. Let me see what Ricky says here. Ricky Smith says, the reason I ask about the speed sensor, when I installed a speed chip on mine, stock controller, it only increased the flat land speed one mile per hour. Wondering if it could have been something to do with speed sensor. Uh, that's, if it did, that's not a symptom that I have seen. And since you brought that up, and since we're talking about it, there's a lot of misconceptions about those chips for PDS cars. You know, PDS cars has a, like four different chips available that you can get. They call them chips. It's the first misconception. That I don't know why they call them chips when it's nothing but a plastic plug. There's nothing electronic about it whatsoever. So I don't know why they call them chips. They, they go from the the bottom of the line is like they call it the steep hill chip. I don't know why they call it that either, but we'll get into that in a minute. And then they, they each get faster. The, the forward is a little bit faster than the next, all the way to what is called the speed chip, which is the one that you're talking about. The, I really should be called the speed plug. Okay. What happens is from the bottom to the top, like from the, the slowest to the, to, the, to the fastest, there is a slight increase in flat ground speed. As you move up to the speed chip, there's a slight increase in speed with a gradual decrease in regenerative braking. All right. In other words, this, the one on the bottom, the one that they call the steep hill chip, a lot of people are under the impression that that helps with torque because of what it's called and because of how it's marketed as the steep hill chip. That's not what they mean. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with torque. That bottom chip has the most amount of regenerative braking and then the next one has a little bit less the next one has a little bit less then the speed chip at the at the end has a little bit less regenerative braking but and progressively gets a little faster uh, ground speed on flat ground the steep hill chip when you come over the top of a hill and you start to go down it almost throw you through the windshield because it's got a whole lot of regenerative braking but that's putting motor back into your into your uh putting I'm sorry, putting uh, amperage back into your battery pack a little bit when it does that, hence regenerative braking. It's, as, it's, as the motor is braking, it puts a little bit of power back into your pack. The steep hill chip is designed for very, very hilly terrain on golf courses that the pro does not want his golfers to be driving really fast and freewheeling down these hills into eternity. So they'll put the steep hill chip in there where you can't do that. Uh, like I said though, it doesn't do anything for torque. It only does something for regenerative braking on the downside of the hill. It has nothing to do with when you climb in the hill. It's only the downside of the hill. Now that's the torque one. And like I said, each one up to the speed chip gradually has less regenerative braking and a little bit more flat ground speed. So if you already had the third one, whatever the third one is, I can't remember. It's either the all-terrain chip or the mild hill chip or something is the third one and you went to the speed chip, probably not going to be a big difference between those two, you know, in speed. So I would say that's about normal. And if you had a speed sensor issue, your car would, uh, it would abruptly drop down to a crawl, you know, is, is what I've seen. Abruptly drop down to a crawl for no reason. That would be a speed sensor issue. All right, we've got a couple more. Keith E., what's up, man? On Facebook, still watching in Palmetto, Florida. Cool day, only 71 degrees, but sunny. Great job. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for coming, man. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you participating. Uh, Ricky, did, did, Ricky says it didn't have any plug at all. Well, that's actually considered one of the plugs. Uh, one of the four is no plug at all. If they actually make a plug, believe it or not, they make a plug that uh, that's I think that's, that's the all-terrain setting. 
they make a plug that has no wire jumper. You know how three of them have a wire jumper? Well, there's one of them that has no wire at all. It's just a plug to take up the hole that is in the controller there where it plugs in. So that's actually considered the all-terrain chip when you have no plug at all. That may be the third, that may be the third one, you know, in line. Let's see. Do I need to change the solenoid? This is number nine. When changing easy go from 36 to 48 volts. Well, the answer is if you want it to be a plug and play installation when you do your conversion, like you want everything to hook exactly back up to where it was when it was 36 to make it easy, then the answer is yes. You need to change the solenoid to a 48 volt solenoid. Now, if you're electrically savvy with golf cart, you can change that solenoid to still activate off of 36 volts if you're going with, if you're going with 412s. It, it, it just, there's a lot of ways you can change that solenoid to activate off of 36, even though your car is 48. Uh, that's it. That just depends on how creative you want to be. But if you want it to be a plug and play installation, then yes, you need to change it to a 48 volt solenoid. And then you can hook it up exactly like it was before. And then you got your 48 volt set of batteries. You got a set of batteries that's 48 volts. You got a new charger. Uh, you, I'm, I'm assuming you understand that you're going to have to change your controller too, because your controller is very voltage sensitive and it's not going to handle 48 volts. Unless you have an aftermarket controller that will. Let's see, Ricky said it went from 13 to 14. That sounds a little slow for the speed chip in a PDS. Uh, I've seen some that are faster than 14. It should be around 19 uh, with that speed chip in there, close to 19 on stock, on a stock golf cart, stock tires, uh, stock controller with the speed chip in it. Uh, you might have to do some testing on your electrical system if you're only getting 14, cause that's a little slow. Something didn't take, maybe that speed chip didn't take or something, something, uh, cause there's a, let me ask you this, are you getting any any type of codes or anything like beep codes because that car does beep out codes you know on the on your controller cover it's got all kinds of beep codes listed and it also tells you how to put your car in diagnostic mode on that controller cover i don't know if you've ever noticed that or not but there's a lot of writing on that controller cover on a pds and it tells you how to enter diagnostic mode i would enter diagnostic mode and see if you're getting any beep codes kurt Says, hey, Tim, sticking around to remind you about the tip. <laughs> well, thank you, Kurt. I appreciate it. I do have a tip. I've got one written down here. I've already talked about it, but we'll talk about it in a minute. But thank you uh, for sticking around to remind me. I need you, Kurt. You're a valuable member of this team. I'm one, let's see, number 10. Says, I'm working on a marathon, 2PG engine. Timing is off. Just wondered if there is a difference between if there is a difference between 2PG and 3PG crankshaft pulse R coil and register correctly at 37.8 ohms or 137.8 ohms. All right, I did not know the answer to this question. I understood the question. I did not know the answer to it off the top of my head, so I had to I had to look it up. And what I did is I, I pulled a photo of a 2PG crankshaft and a 3PG crankshaft. And there is indeed a difference in the photo. So to answer your question, is the answer is yes, there is a difference between a 2PG and a 3PG crankshaft. What he's talking about, he's talking about the crankshaft and the older two-stroke motors for an easy go. Uh, there's, there's, but the photos I looked at, there's definitely a difference uh, between them on one end of the crankshaft. So you, you might, if you, you want to verify what I'm saying, pull photos. That's the, that's the easiest way to do it. Ricky says he will check for codes and get back to me Thursday. All right, cool, Ricky. Did you, did you know that? What I told you about the, the instructions on the outside of the cover? Have you, have you noticed that before? I, I'm curious if you, had, if you knew that or not. Let's see. Joe Foster. Awesome job, Tim. Swag. Make sure to take care of the original Swag Brothers first. I will, Joe. <coughs> Excuse me. 
I will definitely do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see here. We'll run the social media links one more time before we get out of here. <coughs> follow us on. You can either follow us on YouTube and Facebook, like yeah, obviously we do here. You can follow us on TikTok and all these other places, all the other social media links. We can follow us anywhere. Also, I do not have an animation for the code for, for the coupon code which the other one expired don't have an animation today i'll have the animation next time but i can tell you what it is go to uh, golfcartgarage.com and plug in tim9 at checkout tim9 to get five percent off of parts any parts you order at golfcartgarage.com so plug in tim9 at checkout this new code expires april 17th let's see <clears throat> Ricky Smith says, yes, sir. Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good, guys and girls. I appreciate everybody showing up today. Uh, we will be back Thursday with another episode. And that is going to be... Oh! I almost did it, Kurt. I almost left, <laughs> even though you reminded me. All right, this week's tip. We talked about it. It's a, it's the it's a common thing for people to ask me about. It's, it's common practice to do a 48 volt conversion on cars, on, on golf carts, because uh, golf carts, a lot of them used to be 36 volts. So the tip is, if you want your 48 volt conversion to be plug and play, like I said earlier, if you want it to be easy, the easiest way to do it, the most efficient way to do it, and you want it to be plug and play, then change your solenoid to a 48 volt solenoid. You don't have to do that if you know what you're doing, but you know, it just depends on how complicated you want to get. I had a 144 volt car and my solenoid was 12 volt activated solenoid. It's a 12 volt solenoid. So you can, you can electrically change it to activate on 36, but that's what the 36 and the 48 volt mean. That means on what activation voltage that solenoid is designed to run at. So if you want it to be plug and play, get it to a 48 volt solenoid if you do a 48 volt conversion. Need to get you more viewers. Maybe we can get you on three days a week. <coughs> I don't know. If I brought that up, they might go for it. So I don't know if I want to do that or not. But Yes, anything you can do. There's the coupon code. Golf Cart Garage just posted it. Coupon code is TIM9. Expires 417. All right. Let's see here. We got that running. Got that done. That's going to be about it. I will see everybody on Thursday. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'll see you Thursday. Golf, the Golf Cart Garage is now closed. Mm -hmm.